What's up, Dart people? We are back with the language tour on lexical closures. Took a little break there for about the past month, um, but we're back at it. Uh, last time we did lexical scope, um, so check out that video if you haven't checked that out yet. Um, some of the concepts about scope um, will be used in this video. Okay, so what is a, a closure in Dart or in programming in general? Uh, last time we talked about lexical. Um, it's kind of this academic word that I don't really like, but it just means that um, the the function as we as we write it, um, that the variables inside of it are are static. They can't be dynamically. Um, sort of manipulated or set at a later time. And we cover that in the lexical scope video. Um, and then a closure, if you're coming from JavaScript or other uh, programming languages, it's a common feature. And let's just talk about the word first, because like I, I, I kind of struggled with the idea of a closure when I first encountered it, it was very, um, not familiar because of uh, the nature of the word itself. Okay, so a closure, just looking on Google here, the act or process of closing something like an institution, uh, you can close it, you can have a road closure, um, <laughs> uh, the institution has been closed, uh, it's the act or process of closing something, so it's more of a um, the process of shutting something down. Uh, uh, the second one, in a legislative assembly, a procedure for ending debate and taking a vote, a closure motion. Okay, so things are coming to an end. Again, that signifies like action in my mind. And then the third one is a, a sense or resolution um, a sense of resolution or conclusion at the end of an artistic work. Um, okay, so it brings it brings closure, and it's closely related to uh, this final definition, where like if you uh, lose a loved one in your family, um, or you have a traumatic uh, experience, but you're finally at peace, you have um, you have received closure, or you you have closure about the incident. Um, so the example, I am desperately trying to reach closure, but I don't know how to do it without answers from him. So once you have the peace, um, you can have closure about uh, an event. Um, yeah, so it's it became popular, it looks like, you know, 1900s, 1950, it kind of peaked whatever time period this is. I don't know if I can click on that, can I? Okay, so yeah, it looks like it peaked in 1993. Um, I guess this could have been because of computer science, <laughs> you know, uh, the seventies, like, like a peek through here. Um, anyways, that's the definition of closure. Okay. And then, so, so nowhere in here does it talk about, um, what I typically think of when you have a, a function that's declared and it has um, access to the scope of variables, it has access to behavior, like um, things that it does, uh, you know, what the actual function does inside of it. Um, so I tend to think of closures actually as enclosures, um, an area that is sealed off with an artificial or natural barrier, okay? Um, and if we look at that, that artificial or natural barrier are these curly braces. Anything inside here, and for that matter, you know, top level global variables are um, available to the function when it's called later, um, if you're passing it around as a closure. Okay. So I, this is, this is how I really think of it. I, I really wish they would have used the word enclosure. Um, what else do we have here? Yeah, you can think of a document or an object. Um, so let's say you have um, a feather, okay, like a special feather from a bird. 
and you write a letter to somebody who's a bird admirer and you put those two things together in an envelope um, you you have created an enclosure um, or if you have a place where cattle are grazing um, they are enclosed uh, if you have a, a sort of like religious community or something like nuns the nuns kept sh strict enclosure it's the state of being enclosed um, and scoped from the surrounding world. So I really like to think of these things as enclosures, but closure is the word. And I asked about it in the uh, Flutter Discord community a while back about this, this very thing, um, explaining <laughs> my uh, misunderstanding of the words. Um, I don't have a link to the source, but this person, um, they, I assume it's a person, I guess it could be a bot, but um, they are saying this, that Peter Landon defined the term closure in 1964, having an environment part and a control part, having an environment part and a control part, so there's two things, as used by his SECD machine for evaluating expressions. Joel Moses credits Landon with introducing the term closure to refer to a lambda expression whose open bindings, the free variables, um, have been closed or bound in the lexical environment, you know, between those curly braces, uh, resulting in a closed expression or closure. So I think this is how it uh, may have come about. It's a closed expression. They just called it a closure. Um, but the more natural everyday use of words, it more closely resembles an enclosure, is my personal opinion. Uh, it helps me understand it anyways. Okay, and then there's just some more information. So that was nice feedback uh, from the Flutter community there. Thanks, Oppy, with two eyes. Okay, um, yep, enclosure, closure, we define those. Um, so a closure, so here's what Dart says about it, uh, the Dart docs. A closure is a function object that has access to variables in its lexical scope. Okay, so let's first talk about a function object. If I, so sort of disregard um, what's going on up here in this main function for now. Um, well, I guess it's okay. So for example, is the main function a closure right now? I don't think it is because when I look at its return type, it says it returns void. Okay, this function also returns void. This function returns void. I could create a, a function that returns and you know I could you know create this this function called return five, and all it does is return five. Okay, um, have I forgotten how to? Oh, it's not used, of course. So return five. Uh, yeah, so we're calling it now. So it's going to return five. Um, so this isn't a closure either, um, whether I invoke it with parentheses like that or I say return uh, five dot call. Like none of this is a closure, <clears throat> excuse me, as I understand it, because the return time is return type is int when it's executed. However, I, I feel like I can, um, if I had some other, uh, you know, another function that's defined somewhere and it takes a function, I wonder if even though return five returns an integer, if I can pass a, a representation of it, you see how I'm not invoking the function there? I'm just passing in a reference to it, if I could then, maybe another function is defined like this, um, I don't know what it's going to do, but let's just say, let's define it, it takes um, a function, mm, let's leave the type off for now, I'm just playing around here, so bear with me, um, and then we're just going to print whatever function we're passing in, okay? 
Um, let's comment this out. I will use that for demonstration purposes later. So now it looks like everything's good. Um, see, I think I actually have to call my function to get this to work because it's nested in here. Okay. So every, wait, is it? No, it's, it's, it is a sibling of my function. I wish I could collapse these lines, uh, but I can't. Okay, so we don't have to call my function here. I'm just going to command Z. So when I run this, it should run main. It will come down here. Um, that function's defined. It returns it twice. It's not going to print anything. It's just going to return it in the background. So we're not going to see anything over here. Um, what is going to happen though is when it compiles, um, and runs like like this thing is going to be defined. Then when we invoke another function and pass in a reference to this, we're going to print it. Um, so what do we think it's going to print? Do we think it's going to print what is returned, or do you think it's going to print a um, a sort of message that says this is a function? <clears throat> Let's find out. Aha. So it returns a closure, or it's printing um, closure main return five. So even though this is returning an integer, um, return five is both a function that can be called and a closure, depending how it's used. If you just call the thing, then it's just a it's just a function. Uh, that gets called. If you pass a reference to it, okay, now you're you're using the sort of closure representation. So it can wear two different hats. It can say, hey, I'm a function, call me, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, or pass a reference to me later, and like this is really just inspecting what the thing is. Um, if I invoke this as a parameter. So this is the invoked thing. So now I feel like that's going to resolve to five. Um, and because we haven't specified the type here, I think it'll just print five. So let, let's see what that does. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what happened there. We could get very specific and say, pass me a function. Now we're expecting uh, something of type capital F function to be passed in, um, this resolves to an integer. So it's like, whoa, the argument type int, see it, it, it knows because it's defined like that. It knows when I invoke it and that's why it gives me that error. Um, but if I take those off now, it works uh, because a reference to this is a function invoking it returns the integer. Okay, so this is something I just wanted to play around with just a little bit so you can see uh, that you don't have to explicitly return a function, which is what we're going to do next. Okay, I think I can delete all this now. Boom. And then I'll return this back to how it was. Okay, <clears throat> so a closure is a function object. Um, regardless of the type. It is a function object that has access to variables in its lexical scope. Um, there's a video on that. Even when the function is used outside of its original scope. So you can pass it around like a reference to it. Okay, functions can close over variables defined in surroundings scopes. So I'm going to show you something here for this sentence. Um, functions can close over variables defined in surrounding scope. So what does that mean to close over the variables in surrounding scopes? Okay, so let me see. I have this fancy new tool called Screen Brush. Let's try it. All right, so let's look at my function here. So inside my function, um, and if you think about what, a fu like functions and classes can sometimes 
look and feel the same. So for example, I have this little exercise ball here. Um, it has a property and that it, it is round and it also has behavior. Um, it rolls. Okay, so it has property and behavior. This is something that, that classes have uh, properties and methods, right? So this function has this property. Okay, it has a variable called inside function. It has a um, another function in there. That's kind of a, a property itself. Uh, but then at this level, it has an action. It has behavior. This is what my function really does. Uh, to the outside world, it just prints inside nested function. Um, however, inside nested function is defined inside of, of nested function. So my function has access to inside function, nested function as a sort of reference, like it, it can call it, but inside nested function, these this variable is, is, is kind of like a private variable uh, to the outside world. Um, it cannot be seen uh, going outward. Uh, and, and this behavior inside nested function, it also cannot be um, uh, seen from the outside world, um, as far as I know. So, um, oops, let me turn this off real quick. So we looked at functions close over variables defined in surrounding scopes, okay? Oops. So we first wanted to say that this is what my function knows about, but it also, it also knows about the surrounding scope variables. So inside main is now inside my function. Uh, this top level global variable is now also inside my function. Um, and because it works this way, <laughs> uh, inside main is also down here in this one. Uh, and top level is also down in this one. Okay. Um, so that is that is how the functions close over the variables in surrounding scopes. Uh, so even though uh, the curly braces here for my function stop right here, they still kind of close over. So, so in my mind, it's, it's almost like um, if you were super verbose or something and Dart didn't have this language feature, you would just be able to like set inside main here to say, hey, you're defined outside of this function, but I also want you to know about it. Um, and because it's already set to true, um, we're just we're just like including it here manually. Um, but we don't have to explicitly do that because this is a feature um, outside these curly braces. Um, it closes over these variables. So my function knows about these top level things. Similarly, uh, this nested function, okay, it not only scopes this variable to itself and doesn't allow it on the outside, but it also closes over this one. So nested function knows about its, um, its sibling inside function variable. It also knows about inside main and top level, okay, all inside of here. So that's what it means when it says functions can close over variables defined in surrounding scopes outside of the curly braces. Okay, um, I had typed this here to show that um, trying to print inside nested function, right? Now let me bring this back. I will clear it. Let me do that like that. Yeah inside nested function is only defined in these curly braces. Um, so anywhere outside of it, um, 
we, we can't print because it's only scoped right there. Okay. Cool. All right. So that was <clears throat> the first couple of sentences. Um, the Dart docs also give us this example called make adder. Okay, so this is the, the real next step to talking about closures. Um, let's go ahead and copy this stuff over to Dartpad inside main. No, everything, right, okay. So we have um, a function. Now, this is interesting because we have this function called make adder. It takes an integer parameter argument. Uh, it does something. It doesn't actually like add anything itself. It creates an adder or it makes an adder type function. Um, so the return type here is function. And then you see how this sort of, uh, this function notation, um, this, is, this is really like an anonymous function. It's not named because we're giving the whole representation of this logic the name make adder. Okay, um, so it's a function that returns a function. And the point is that it now makes it dynamic. Uh, so down here we can call make adder, pass in the number two. Okay, so now we have this new function called um, add two. This is a, this is a function like the, the type of add two. Um, like if I print add two dot runtime type, it's going to be a function. Um, can I do that? <clears throat> yeah, and so it's a it's a function that takes an integer. Okay, um, right. So this is what it returned. You see this? So even though I'm printing add two which is, we actually called make adder, it, it was called, we passed in a real number. Um, it takes an integer i and it returns an integer. That's, that's the, the function signature, if you will. Okay, that's the runtime type. Um, and so you can tell it's a function, but it gives you a little more detail. It doesn't just say function. Okay. Um, yeah, so we can print or assert. If we print, we actually get something over here. Um, if you add three to two, you should get five. So both of these should return true um, because we have we have made two different functions. This function here called add two. This function called add four. Now we used variable here. I think I don't know that we can add, do a const. I don't think we can do that. Yeah, because it's, it's um, we don't know what we're gonna call it with, but I think we can say, what's the return type here? I think we, instead of a variable, we can call it a function. Like we can be explicit. Um, here's the, like the blueprint, uh, but then when we use it, we're still creating functions here. That's the important bit. Um, um, yeah, so add by uh, when it's called here, like make adder two, <clears throat> that variable is enclosed uh, inside what is returned. So it's sort of this static, you know, potential energy, the number two that's just waiting to be used. Um, and as soon as we assign it to add two, sorry, as soon as we call add two, um, it boom, it gets applied to three. So we're passing in three there. It applies the two that it knows about from earlier and um, is equal to five. So that's another way I, I like to think about these is whenever you call the function that returns the function, the closure, um, this number you're passing in becomes sort of like potential energy, like a, um, it's like a match waiting to be struck. Um, or it's like uh, an electron waiting to go through a wire, like as soon as you plug in a device, like the electrons start flowing, right? That's how electricity works. It's potential energy 
um, that will be applied as soon as it's invoked or called called upon to do so. Okay, so so I guess in closing, um, when you define a function, even if it's just like your standard function, a reference to it is technically a closure. Um, <laughs> two is that function. Yeah, what happens if we just print make adder? I want to do that real quick. If we just do a reference to make adder, you know, compared to um, Okay. So you see how when I call print make adder, it says, hey, there's this closure called make adder. Um, okay, I'm gonna change these back to assert, so. Okay, I did this earlier, ah, okay. This is interesting. All right, check this out. I just discovered this. Okay. If inside main, okay, this is our entry point into our program. If we print make adder, this is a top level function. It's kind of global right outside of main. Um, I'm printing a reference to it. Uh, so just like we saw earlier from the, the previous code, um, printing a reference shows you that it's a closure. <clears throat> okay. So just by defining it and passing a reference to it, it's like, that's a closure, plain and simple. So this, this is a closure. Now, well, that's going to be like that. Let's change that to a var. Okay. I'm going to run this again, just so we can see it very clearly. Well, it's a little bit different now. Where was I doing that? It doesn't change anything. I just thought. Interesting. I'll have to go back and watch this because I, I could have swore that somehow we were able to print. Oh, we did the runtime type, duh. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you call it var or function. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to being explicit. Um, I've done that before. Okay. All right, let's print this again. Final demonstration. Printing make adder shows us that it's a closure. Okay. Um, add to is a function um, that is created from calling make adder with a parameter with an argument of two. Okay. That's why we called our we named our function add two. Um, if I print a reference to add to, well, just like make adder, any printing any reference to a function just tells you that it's a, a closure. Okay, in both cases we say it's a closure uh, because this first one was only defined once here. It's just closure make adder. Um, whenever I printed add to, well, now it's a closure of make adder closure. <laughs> okay. So this is sort of dynamic in the sense that it can be called with any, with any um, arguments, like any number that it expects. Okay, so it's dynamic in that sense. Um, but also the different objects that are created, the function object that's created from that um, is also a closure, made from a closure. All right, so that's why you see that notation. 
uh, finally, the thing that was tripping me up was um, just printing the runtime type. So this is almost like at compile time, it knows that this is a closure, uh, but whenever we actually, um, the, the runtime type at the time uh, gives us this more detailed information that uh, add to and add four uh, take an integer and return an integer. Okay, and we're saying it returns an integer. So let's just print and verify that. Add two, if you pass in three, it'll be five. Add four, if you pass in three, it should be seven. Add two, three is just five, yeah, okay. We can still do math, okay. That, I think, is everything we wanted to discuss about closures. Um, functions that enclose the things that they are um, either defined or called with, like if they're, especially if they're returning a function, um, it's a way to make functions even more dynamic. It's dynamic in the first place, so you can call it like that. So it's, it's kind of a tricky concept to get your head around. Um, it's almost like function inception. Um, which is what we, we saw here. There's a closure and a closure. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Inception. Um, yeah. Kind of tricky, but uh, the important thing is that <clears throat> when the function's defined, it has properties and behavior. Um, if I return a function and I call it with those parameters that it, it expects, um, it creates another closure that I can then invoke at a later time. So I'm sort of passing these things around, um, invoking them at a later time. Um, so they are in turn dynamic. And that is, that is it for closures. So next time we'll go over to um, testing functions for equality and then finally return values and we'll be out of functions. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll breeze through the operators. All right, thanks for spending your time with me.